All right. So, um, yeah, welcome to everybody uh, that's joined this evening. For those that don't know, my name is Mornay Christo. I'm your host this evening and also the Day in Southern Africa CEO. So, as always, great to have everybody joining the webinar. Uh, I know that your time is valuable, so we really appreciate the time you put aside to listen to all that we have to share every odd week or so. Um, and um, I hope that you'll find the webinar informative. And if you have any questions, obviously, you're welcome to engage with us. But most importantly, I hope that everybody's doing well, seeing that things are slowly getting back to to normal. And uh, even though it feels like we, you know, out of the, the scare sort of phase, that we're all still safe and healthy. Uh, the talk topic this evening is fitness to dive. And um, yeah, it packs a punch. So I hope you're in uh, for... Uh, for uh, you know the, the long run this evening. It's not gonna be too long, but we're looking at about an hour discussion or so. Uh, just a couple of basic housekeeping rules. You'll find you're muted and your video is turned off. It's just the webinar setting. Um, and then if you have uh, any questions or you'd like to introduce yourself for the moment, use the chat box, let us know where you're from in the world. And if you have any expectations of the webinar, and uh, towards the end of the webinar, obviously we open it up for the Q&A session. Um, it'll be best if you can make use of the Q&A little uh, tick box or, or function, just to ensure that I don't uh, lose any of the, um, uh, what you call it, uh, questions that you might have for, for Dr. Cronier. So the webinar replay as always will be available tomorrow and you'll find it by the Dan Southern Africa YouTube channel, as well as the Facebook uh, um, page that we have. And then obviously I'll send a, a follow-up email with quite a lot of links that we'll be talking about this evening. Uh, and it'll also include the replay link. Now, as usual, uh, we like to just um, uh, provide some information or a, a little bit of a prize at the end of the webinar in the form of a lucky draw. And this evening, the lucky draw again, we've got some great Dan Buffs, three of them. So we'll have three folks. I'll enter uh, all the names of the folks that registered into uh, a random online software picking kind of system. And uh, we'll see who, um, who will be the lucky draw winner. So stick around till the end. Uh, and uh, yeah, welcome to the folks that have joined us via the Facebook live streams. Great to have you on board. Um, I'll be monitoring the uh, comments and chats uh, via the, uh, the Facebook uh, stream. So if you have any, yeah, you're welcome to ask and I'll pass that on to Dr. Cronier. So let's meet our guest speaker. For those that don't know, Dr. Franz Cronier um, is the founder of Dan Southern Africa. So really honored to have you on board and, and present all these talks. He's the former president and, uh, of, uh, and CEO. And he's also a medical doctor with a passion for dive medicine, and he's a scuba diver himself. So um, with that said, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Franz Cronier. I hope everybody's going to enjoy the webinar. Sit back, relax, and enjoy it. Uh, over to you, Dr. Franz Cronier. Well, thank you, Mornay. And um, this is certainly a topic of, uh, of passion for me. And we'll talk about medical and health aspects of diving, of which fitness is going to be the major theme. And, uh, and it is an uh, almost inexhaustible topic. So uh, clearly, we can't cover everything. But we'll cover some of the central tenets that will then lead to further questions and links that uh, we'll be showing you through the course of the evening. And Mornay's prepared. And um, I think you have a lot to look forward to as far as that's concerned. I want to start off by mentioning what I mentioned a few moments ago, the Diving Safety Officer, which is, I would say, an evolving program with a concept um, of starting with individuals, you know, a person's buddy that's essentially looking out for them, uh, but looking beyond the obvious of the dive briefing towards the overall safety of the entire diving experience, uh, uh, from walking to the bungalow to uh, getting on the, on the boat and everything else, um, which is then uh, abbreviated DSO. So when you hear DSO or Diving Safety Officer, don't feel intimidated. What that is about is really um, the, the, the concept of expanding the understanding of safety and risk 
beyond the the immediate sort of buddy preoccupation, which is where we started. And then the second aspect will be uh, talking about hazard identification and risk assessment and what we mean by that when hazards actually become risks. So that's the uh, that's the um, introductory punchline, if you like. And the main sections that we'll be discussing, uh, firstly, the medical and, <clears throat> and fitness aspects, and again, breaking them down into sort of digestible bits, uh, giving you the means to think about how to think about these things when you're confronted with the challenges. And then the second part, the uh, health and safety aspects, and uh, again, showing you some of the key lectures and topics that are expanded in various ways on the blogs, on links, uh, and the many things that uh, Mornay's promised he is going to be making available. Okay, so part one, the medical and fitness aspects of diving. Here, we're clearly talking about fitness for recreational diving. We're not talking about commercial diving, although there's a blur when we're looking at instructors that in a sense are commercial divers, but it falls within the ambit of recreational diving. Uh, but scuba diving has really become a host household name over the past 70 years. And um, uh, the individuals participating in it have become older and older. The average age, recent polls have set at around 34. So uh, it's, it's moving up. And as people grow older, well, they're more likely to have fitness issues in general or health issues. And they bring that with them into the diving arena. So one needs to be aware of those. And it's very easy to just look at a medical condition and say uh, a person is unfit to dive. But the art of um, the assessment of fitness to dive lies in the concept of hazard identification and risk assessment. In other words, there is a hazard in the form of the, the medical condition. There is a potential risk, which means if you take that into the water diving, and what one then needs to, to determine is, does that combination in the context of fitness to dive make sense? Um, or do you need to define the environment in which that would be appropriate? In other words, what sort of diving can this individual undertake with a condition or with certain safety measures and still be able to, to do it sensibly? So uh, we started in the 1960s, where at that stage, diving uh, was dangerous, if uh, to put it frankly, uh, in the sense that the equipment was rather um, primitive, and individuals that took part in the sport were typically very fit individuals, um, and... Um, were prepared to take the risk. Nowadays, uh, the young people sometimes think it's too tame because sort of gra granny and grandpa are diving and the equipment has become very supportive. And um, it's uh, reached the stage where people uh, don't even necessarily realize the, the need to be able to swim in order to dive. And indeed, you can dive without being able to swim, but it erodes confidence. And we always encourage watermanship as part of that and uh, the fitness that goes with it. What we are most concerned about when it comes to fitness to dive is anything that leads the person whether it's the circumstances or a medical condition that leads them to a, a mental state, a state which we call panic, which is where you fall back um, on instinctive behavior rather than the rehearsed and overlearned behavior, which is what uh, dive training is meant to instill. You get the theory, you get the exercises over and over and over to really get you into a frame of mind that if things go wrong, you stop, think, breathe, plan and act or however the, the training agency approaches that. And all the agencies have a way in which they, they uh, teach this, but the principles are the same. And the philosophy is to have enough education to give you understanding and conditioning, which is rehearsing 
um, the safety maneuvers so that you will fall back on those rather than resort to panic, which is what we want to avoid. Now, one of the practical ways in which we have approached fitness to diving for recreational uh, scuba divers has been the evolution of the Recreational Scuba Training Council medical uh, questionnaire. And this questionnaire is meant to do a number of things. First of all, um, th there is no uh, statutory prerequisite for someone to be fit to uh, exercise a sport. You, you're not examined before you cl climb Table Mountain, for instance, or you don't need to, to um, uh, um, meet some statutory demand. So the, the draw behind this particular form is largely liability and is the mitigation of liability. In other words, this is a way for the instructor or the operator or the resort to ensure that the person who's participating in the sport has an understanding of what the risks are. And it's very easy to check all the boxes, ignore everything that's written and pretend it doesn't apply, but that completely defeats the object. Uh, the form was very well thought through and it takes you into the realm in which you assess the physical, mental, and social aspects that are relevant to diving. And we'll drill into each of these domains because they make up the thought process of whether or not diving is appropriate for a particular individual. And it stands to reason as we go into these that from a mental point of view, you should be conscious and alert, intelligent enough to be trained and psychologically and emotionally stable enough to be able to apply the training. Physically, you should be able to equalize the air spaces, free of incapacitating illness or, Ill, uh, or injuries, have enough aerobic fitness, and I'll define that later, and of course have the physical build or the modifications to wear the diving equipment safely and effectively so that you're able to do the dive. The part that is not necessarily understood as clearly is firstly the liability aspect. In other words, if you decide to take the risk um, uh, and not uh, be completely forthright on your form, you uh, are incurring a certain amount of liability, not only on the school operator and instructor, but you are actually also compromising your buddy whom uh, you have a tacit understanding is there to look after you while you look after them. Now, you can't fully take responsibility for another person, but if you don't disclose an obvious health risk factor to another person, you are being um, selfish at the very least, or, you know, really putting everybody at risk uh, um, if depending on what the condition is. So I'd really like to emphasize, especially because there isn't a legal driver behind fitness for recreational diving, that we have a social responsibility when it comes to fitness to dive. That's a very, very important concept to drive home and for people to understand it's not just about you it's about your loved ones that don't want to lose you and it's about your buddy that is counting on you and it's the dive school or operator or instructor that is um, uh, making certain assumptions about your fitness to dive and and you should honor that and meet that and the form gives you the means to do so now we talk about risk assessment and sometimes risks aren't obvious. Uh, this, what you're looking at is a board that starts off saying, caution, this sign has sharp edges, don't touch it, uh, be careful not to come near it. Oh, and by the way, the bridge is out up ahead. So what seems to be the obvious, the things like epilepsy, uh, asthma and diabetes uh, for which there are uh, increasing, uh, um, uh, there is increasing latitude to allow people to participate uh, in the sport with these conditions 
as we are better and, and better able to manage the risk um, that is related to it, we also need to understand that there are some underlying conditions that we need to consider um, and uh, we, we may not necessarily factor in, um, especially if these are conditions that might um, intrude upon our dive to the extent that we should have the ability to return to the surface at any stage. If that's the case, then you shouldn't do decompression, stop diving, or dive in a cave that would prohibit you from returning to the surface. And you also <clears throat> would, wouldn't be diving in a remote location where you don't have access to appropriate medical care. So those are things that you should think about when it comes to fitness to dive. Now, if we just look at the very, very basic risk issues when it comes to diving, um, our greatest concerns would be loss of consciousness or lack of the ability to, to think or cognitive impairment, uh, failure to be trained, either because of attention deficit or cognitive problems or uh, language barriers, uh, you know, all of these things playing a role, psychomotor skills, whether you have the ability to be coordinated enough to be trained, whether you are exercise tolerant enough to be able to participate in the sport, whether you have the physique that you can wear the equipment, whether your air spaces can tolerate the pressure changes, and or whether you have some underlying condition which may catch up with you um, at an un at unanticipated and certainly an inconvenient time. So we need to appreciate that if you look at Joe's, Joe Soap, if you like, or John Doe, or you know uh, the average individual, it's understood that there is a 1% lifetime risk that uh, people will lose consciousness by fainting, seizures, or whatever. So as soon as someone has a condition that moves them away from that 1% lifetime risk and starts becoming something that is uh, uh, much higher than that, then we start becoming concerned. Uh, on top of that, we then get to the point uh, where we ask, is it a predictable problem or an unpredictable one? For instance, there are forms of epilepsy that only occur at night. Now, clearly, uh, unless you are asleep while you're diving, uh, you wouldn't be at risk if, if that's the form of epilepsy you have. On the other hand, if you have unpredictable losses of consciousness, then diving isn't for you because uh, for the most part, lo loss of consciousness equals drowning when it comes to diving. Next one that we could mention is medication. People look at medication, and yes, there are anti-epileptics, anti-hypertensives, anti-dysrhythmics, and, and, uh, and uh, psychiatric medication, but the medication isn't really the issue. The issue is often the underlying condition for which it is taken. Clearly, we want people to be able to think uh, while they're underwater and uh, people need to uh, be diving with a clear head and um, I mentioned here diving under the influence of alcohol I'd uh, just like to mention uh, recently there's been a, uh, um, a high court case in which an airline transport pilot was found to be flying under the influence of alcohol even though their blood alcohol level was zero. The fact is they were hungover, didn't sleep very well, and they were still, fly uh, they were still flying under the influence of alcohol, even though they didn't have alcohol in their bloodstream. And so we, we need to think beyond uh, the substances towards the underlying issues. Something that uh, I've been asked very regularly, what about cannabis? Well, if you are employed, then there's usually some sort of company policy and cannabis products stay in the urine for uh, a month. And if spot checks are done, 
um, you will be found to have been exposed to cannabis. So if you are employed, then cannabis is pretty much out, even though it's legal under certain conditions. If you are a regular recreational diver, then we still don't recommend it, but at least I'd like to give you two um, numbers that you can put hang your hat on. And the one is, and looking at it scientifically, after a single joint, four hours, you should get back to sort of psychoneuro baseline. If you've eaten something that has uh, cannabis in it, then it takes about eight hours. So that's a question that's often asked or maybe isn't. And um, I at least would like to give you some of the facts behind that. Then there's the training issue. Clearly people need to be of age that they are able to be trained. Um, we have set and the training agencies have set 12 years as um, the sort of supervised level where a person um, is both mature enough and are, they would be able to understand the risk uh, that they're putting themselves under, for instance, lung overpressure injuries and so on, where they are actually able to give a, a relative level of informed consent. But we are assuming intelligence, uh, emotional stability, and uh, the absence of pho phobias, a certain amount of coordination and physique that would allow an individual to participate. And Mornay, I, I can see you, so I'm watching you. If you uh, raise your hand, then I'll know there's something that I need to pay attention to. So please just do that. And uh, then I'll be able to uh, respond to whatever it is as we go along. Yeah, no, for the moment, all's good, uh, Dr. Cronier. A couple of questions coming in, but I think we'll keep them to the end. Uh, okay. Otherwise, we might disrupt the rhythm. All right. So just so um, uh, that the people know that are posting the questions, we plan to get to them. Um, at the moment, we're going at sort of 7,000 miles per minute to, to uh, cover the material so that we have the substance on which we can then build the questions that you might already have and might be the reason why you join, you join this talk. As far as exercise tolerance and equipment problems goes, the, the goal that was set by an American cardiologist was really based on some of the uh, uh, US Navy standards, which was the ability to swim against the two knot current, which was 13 times metabolic basal, basal metabolic rate. In other words, if you're sitting on a couch, that's one met. And as you increase the amount of energy you spend, the number of METs increases. As it's, there are far more complicated calculations to get to the number of METs you actually expend. But to give you a sense of what this means is 13 METs, which used to be the standard that was imposed uh, when people were, were examined for potential cardiovascular issues represents uh, going 13 uh, kilometers per hour on a treadmill. So, you know, the, the numbers more or less match. So it'll give you a sense of what that means. Now, 10 to 13 has been put forward as the ideal, but I think if we impose that on most of the diving public, we'll probably lose at least a third of, if not more, of the people diving. And the reality is, for most dives, seven to nine mets is probably what you need to do. And to, to give you just a practical thing to hang your hat on, if you are able to do a brisk walk for five minutes, that represents a level of fitness that is probably compatible uh, with most forms of recreational diving. And we're not talking extreme diving here. We're talking uh, really average, benign forms of diving. So brisk walk, five minutes, uh, at, that's something that you at least should be able to do. There are medical classifications that I don't want to get into um, that look at heart failure and so on uh, that, that can be used. Physically, we want people to have at least enough size and strength to be able to wear the equipment. 
Um, they, they need to have bones and bone structures that can bear the brunt of the boat ride and wearing the equipment, for instance. And we do rely on people having teeth or at least the ability to keep the regulator in the mouth or an adaptation that would allow them uh, to breathe through a regulator. It sounds silly, but you know these things sometimes become relevant. Um, if you have loose dentures, for instance, they can become a choking hazard or they can be the reason why you lose a regulator. People need to be agile enough to be able to move and do the things they need to do uh, uh, to participate in diving, for instance, the ability to fin and maneuver in the water. And as I mentioned, watermanship really is something that we'd like people to have. And uh, training water for 10 to 15 minutes is, is probably a nice way to test yourself if it wasn't done in your dive course to see whether you have enough watermanship and it adds a lot of confidence. And similarly, if you can swim underwater holding your breath um, for about 10 to 15 meters, that also represents a certain level of watermanship, which uh, is very reasonable and uh, again, builds confidence. Okay, now barotrauma is a very broad subject, but essentially anything filled with gas in our body if we take it underwater, it undergoes pressure volume change and Boyle's law plays a role. Ears are the big problem. They're the most common problem we have in diving. Uh, most of the calls we get, most of the people we see from a recreational diving point of view have got equalizing problems and we address those. Um, it's one of the greatest weaknesses. The second being infections of the ear, but that's not barotrauma. That's, that's another issue and another topic. Sinuses, um, we have found people that have injured themselves very badly with acute sinus infections, whereas we have many divers that have chronic sinusitis and find that diving actually improves their sinus condition. So again, it's something that we need to look at from a hazard and a risk point of view. We mustn't make assumptions. We must uh, really uh, make intelligent decisions about these things and have discussions about them. When it comes to the lungs, if you've ever had a spontaneous pneumothorax, in other words, if your lung has ever collapsed spontaneously without anybody stabbing you or without any blunt force trauma, then diving is not for you. That I can say emphatically. We look for scarring on x-rays. People who've had tuberculosis and have scarring would typically not be allowed to dive. And people who have asthma that is unstable would not be allowed to dive. And so that's something that we can say there. And then what we forget about is there are other parts of our body that have gas as well. Our gastrointestinal tract, hernias for instance, which is where uh, our intestines move into areas where they shouldn't be, for instance, through the abdominal wall or through the diaphragm. And it may be something as simple as heartburn, or it may be as complicated as a, what we would call strangulated hernia, which is where the intestines literally get trapped um, in, our, in our loins or in, a, um, in our groins, if you like. And that could be a disaster uh, if you go diving with those. If you've had an operation for reflux, then you may not be able to burp as easily and, and um, release uh, compressed gas that you swallowed. And that may be a source of tremendous discomfort. So those are things that should be discussed and considered. And then lastly, there are many, and I mean, if you look at the Merck manual, the Merck manual is sort of swollen into something that contains thousands of diseases, many of which could result in acute incapacitation. And it would be impossible to list all of those or discuss all of those uh, off the bat. So all I can say in summary really is that we have anything from head to toe that we should consider. And the basic principle that if you have something that can suddenly cause incapacitation, you should not do the sort of diving that would put you in a position that you can't return to the surface basically immediately. So you don't want to do virtual or actual 
um, decompression, stop diving. You don't want to dive in a cave or you don't want to dive where you have to stop because your uh, uh, dive profile insists that you should because if you develop a problem, you want to get to the surface and you don't want to dive in a remote location where you can't get medical help. Okay, so now with all that, what do we actually do or how do we apply this in practice? And that brings us back to the medical statement form. It's there for a reason. And we encourage divers to take it seriously, to read it through and to be informed about uh, what they are letting themselves into. Together with the form is a list of questions which typically uh, is built on those conditions that might interfere with a person's fitness to dive. And the principle is that if you check something as, yes, this applies to me, then the uh, uh, instructor or resort would then typically want a medical practitioner and ideally a diving medical practitioner to clear you from that. In certain cases, We've had uh, calls to Dan about these conditions, and we've been able to resolve the concern uh, with sort of a telemedical or uh, teleconsultation, if you like, and just say, no, it's okay, because this, this, and this. But sometimes it does require uh, a medical examination. And we realize that there's a temptation to just uh, jot over this and just gloss over it and mark everything as no, it doesn't apply. But apart from not being truthful, it is potentially dangerous and selfish because you might be putting others at risk, yourself at risk, and your loved ones who care about you at risk. So we encourage uh, divers to take those forms seriously. They're there for a reason. Once you've gone through that, in the recreational diving setting, we don't have a, uh, with the exception of Australia, we don't really have what we would call the standard fitness to dive. Yes, you're fit. No, you're not fit. The way it's worded is as follows. A, a diving physician would say, I find no conditions that pose a contraindication to diving. In other words, I've looked at you and I haven't found anything that says you can't dive versus I can't recommend you to dive. So that means we're not your, your parents. We don't take a parochial stance where we are, are sort of lording it over you. We're basically just saying, listen, um, uh, we, we haven't found anything that's a problem or it's probably not a good idea for you. And today I actually saw uh, a diver um, uh, who's, who's pregnant and we had a long discussion about the merits and demerits and concerns about diving with pregnancy. And then there's an opportunity for remarks. And those remarks, um, I would, those of you that are diving doctors and maybe listening in, um, the remarks should be sensible. If you, uh, if you put a restriction on a diver that would uh, disallow them from actually being trained, it's going to be a bit moot. So, you know, uh, no deeper than five meters, for instance, is, is going to be a problem because the greatest risk is the first five meters. Um, simulating the emergency uh, swimming ascent, well, there are ways that that can be done. But in principle, again, just be thoughtful about the remarks that you, that you add. Okay. And then, uh, Mornay, anything yet that, that I need to respond to or barrel, again, barrel ahead so far? Okay, all right. So two things. There are certain, let's call it bad diseases and in inverted commas, bad dives. And what I mean by that is bad diseases are those that affect your alertness or consciousness, your ability to exercise and your ability to adjust to the pressure of the environment. And they may fall in any of these categories from psychiatric to any other acute disease. So any disease that has those three consequences would be potentially a bad disease or condition that needs evaluation. With bad dives, they're not really bad. What I mean to say by that 
is that they are dives that involve exercise, exertion, exposure, elaborate equipment, which means it might be heavy, complicated, and technical, or extremes, again, depth, duration, decompression stops, or distance from the dive site, all of which may be fine for one diver, but not for someone that has a particular impairment or, or, or health concern. So things like decompression, stop diving, ice diving, trimix diving, diving in currents, high seas, shore entries, or tough boat launches may not be for everybody. So that's a very important thing to consider. Um, the last thing I'm going to say uh, before I uh, close the first part of the webinar and, and allow some questions that may have come in is just the issue of children and diving. Um, there's, there are a lot of urban legends. For instance, um, the fact that bubbles might form in the growth plates and therefore stunt a child's growth. The type of diving children would be doing would really not pose that type of risk. A more relevant concern is that there is a higher incidence of shunts or holes in the heart in those who are younger, and therefore you would prefer them to do bubble-free or shallower dives, and certainly under supervision. But the assumption is that the child should be able to make the decision uh, and understand the risk that, that they're undertaking, and also be able to wear the equipment that would allow them to dive, because most equipment is designed for adults, and the equipment you get for children typically isn't very high quality, and therefore uh, may in and of itself uh, pose a hazard. So at that point, I'm just going to uh, take a breath, have some water, and take some questions if uh, something has come in, Mornay. Absolutely. Uh, we've got uh, by the Q&A section, roughly about six, seven questions. So let's see how far we get. Um, okay. Russell Opland, uh, he's been posing, you know, as you've been going through some of the topics, some great questions as usual. Thank you, Russell, for uh, keeping the conversation going. First question, he says, I've been told that only swimming is an effective exercise for swimming fitness because of the particular muscle groups involved. I've been told that other aerobic activities like running or cycling can be detrimental to swimming fitness because the muscles those activities exercise are somehow in uh, opposition to the muscles used for swimming. Is there any truth to this? I assume aerobic fitness or aromatic fitness, uh, but perhaps this issue speaks to uh, muscle strength. Um, uh, many thanks in advance. So basically swimming versus you know, other kind of exercise. Yes. That's a great question, and I, I would uh, start with a disclaimer of saying I'm not a biokineticist because they are the people that actually look at those aspects specifically. But what is definitely true is that certain types of fitness are transferable, whereas others are not. The, one of the best examples uh, is that people who jog typically do well cycling, but people who do cycling don't necessarily jog very well. So, so that's an example of non-transferable or, or less transferable levels of fitness. Um, as far as swimming and jogging goes, there is a certain amount of, of carryover, but um, swimming relies uh, uh, largely on the legs um, uh, uh, being the primary means of propulsion, whereas some of the other forms of sport may also involve the upper body, which uh, would be relevant in swimming, but, but not in diving. So you may be exercising certain parts of the body that are irrelevant uh, to the diving side. So I think that's probably as far as my um, knowledge of your very, very uh, well articulated question uh, mm -hmm. goes. And uh, if you could please post that, we'd like to, to invite a biochemistician. And we have those as Dan members to, mm -hmm. to answer that. So uh, right. thank you for that question. Great question. Go so, ahead. Another question from Russell. Um, do the tym tympanic membrane and round window become fitter to dive with uh, recurrent dives? If so, approximately what period of time would be required? 
thank you in advance. Okay, that, well, that's a very uh, interesting question. It is true that if you um, either perforate, uh, well, let me put it two ways. Um, perforation of the tympanic membrane may go one of two ways. You may either develop a thickened tympanic membrane or a thinned tympanic membrane. So it's not to say that it would necessarily become stronger, mm. but there are cases that it does. Mm. So that is as far as the tympanic membrane is concerned. As far as the oval and round window is concerned, you wouldn't particularly want to, to, to have the oval window become fitter, if I could put it that way, because that would constitute a form of conductive hearing loss. Mm. Um, uh, it would mean it would become more rigid or more stiff. Mm. Um, what is true is that people who have had round window ruptures or any ear ruptures, uh, and those have been patched, it's that the round window is then actually stronger than it was prior to, to the rupture. So that part is true. But um, I would be very loath to, um, uh, to predict the outcome of, of diving on those structures per se. Mm -hmm. So we have some more questions. Are you happy to answer them or would you like to continue, Dr. Krenia? Um, well, let's, let's take one more and then okay. we go ahead. All right, so another question from Russell. If one is aware that one is unfit, can one mitigate the risk of cardiovascular events while diving by limiting exertion? Or are uh, there other physiological aspects of diving at play as well? Thank you. Well, that's a great question. Once again, you know, in, in anesthetics, um, and this is a, a South Africanism, and I know there's some international people listening, but there's the so-called Woolies Index, which basically means if you cannot see the individual pushing a trolley full of groceries in one of the popular uh, grocery stores, then you don't give them an anesthesia. OK, because it, and then it gives you a sense of their fitness. Now, the equivalent of that in diving is a brisk walk for five minutes. If a person can't maintain that, then there are probably some question marks. Mm. That's not to say that they would not be able to enjoy, for instance, diving in a very, very controlled environment, uh, warm water pool or tidal pool or something like that. Um, as long as their cardiovascular fitness is such that the 30% return of venous blood that happens simply by being immersed doesn't put them into cardiac failure. Mm. So, so again, it's, it's a hazard risk equation and it's not an always or never, you know, uh, the, 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 the most famous response that you'll probably hear from me is it depends because you, you, that is almost always the answer to these questions because it depends on a number of circumstances. Okay, with that, I'm going to uh, just carry on. Mm -hmm. Again, we're talking about medical and health aspects of diving. And the second part is more um, posed towards the safety aspect. Now, we know that diving affects your health and health can affect diving. We know that physiological and psychological issues are at stake. And most of um, will have a basic fam familiarity with the medical issues in to have a foundational understanding to be able to communicate and uh, uh, and to exchange information, uh, both in the in the case of teaching divers and communicating with healthcare personnel, but. It, it certainly isn't expected of divers or diving instructors to uh, be health professionals. Um, it's, it's very helpful in certain situations, but it's certainly not essential. What is essential, though, is that one should realize that skills, um, there's an attrition of skill and refreshers, even if it is just a, a pool test prior to diving, really goes a long way. What is the reason why we've decided to move towards this whole uh, diving safety officer and uh, hazard identification and risk assessment approach? Well, the reason for that is we want to establish a culture in which divers actually are thoughtful, vigilant, and responsible about how they dive, 
and in doing so actually establish uh, I would say um, a, a, an, an organism, because Dan is more than an, an organization, it's an organism made of people who care for each other, all divers, and are passionate about the sport and, and want to actually contribute. And we see that uh, in the research, for instance, that is done. Divers really uh, uh, very, very readily participate in research and uh, are very interested about these things. And, and we're delighted about that. So um, we'd like to encourage that sort of attitude. And that is what these initiatives really are trying to achieve. We want people to have a sound understanding of, of the health and fitness uh, that's involved, be safety motivated, continue ed education, understand what is ideal versus real, because we live in an imperfect world and sometimes one needs to make discretionary decisions, which you can if you do and understand the, the, the risks and the hazards uh, well enough to be able to do so. But it is really a culture of awareness, safety consciousness, and responsibility that we want to achieve. So those are the goals. We want to minimize the, uh, the uh, demands that the environment would impose, if we can. Otherwise, avoid difficulties as far as possible. And if there are unfortunate interactions, well, to manage them in a way that will uh, lead to the best possible outcome. Um, and that means preparation and rescue equipment or, or uh, procedures that are put in place, such as lost diver procedures, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the, the, the tenets of uh, where we're moving uh, towards. What is relevant? How do we address it? How do we keep it practical? Well, we need to know that diving is very popular and about 6 million divers diving uh, and that scuba diving itself is completely abnormal. All your senses are deranged. I don't know whether any, everybody heard that when we uh, started off the uh, webinar, but basically there isn't a single sense of the five senses that isn't completely distorted or changed. Vision changes, hearing changes, smells irrelevant, taste doesn't help, and a tactile sense of orientation in space is no longer largely relevant. So there needs to be a certain ability to be flexible cognitively to be able to adjust as well as physiologically. Uh, because of the change in gravity, etc. And for that reason, here are some of the points to ponder. And I love uh, mnemonics, or if failing which, I come up with you know letters that that uh, that hopefully will will uh, jog people's memory. But the prompts that we have about fitness are, first of all, the physical, mental, and social rings or domains that I mentioned. First of all. Secondly, first aid. How have you planned in terms of emergencies, management, and treatment? Fluids. How have you planned to remain hydrated and to rehydrate, both just as a maintenance measure, but also possibly as a therapeutic measure? Fizzing. How do you decide on the decompression profile that you follow, the dive profile you follow? And what breathing gas do you choose based on the risk uh, uh, averseness or, or um, the risk acceptance you might have? Fainting. What are the risks of loss of consciousness? And are there ways to mitigate that? Fighting. That means what sort of hazardous marine creatures may be in the environment and uh, uh, you need to be aware of. Frothing, which is where the equipment fails or leaks, um, you play rental roulette and uh, you get water um, uh, uh, into the lungs and that produces its own concern of which drowning would of course be uh, one of the worst outcomes. And then lastly, fever. And when I refer to fever here, of course, we've all uh, been under this uh, pandemic, but COVID isn't the only thing that causes fever. Um, and uh, you don't only contract the illness causing fever at the dive site. Um, you may be traveling through an area where you are exposed 
to the conditions, the food, all the mosquitoes that ultimately produce the disease at the dive site or after returning home. And these are things that people should think through. And uh, 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 you know, they, they, they point to ponder. And so there are specialty lectures because there's no way that we can cover everything. And so what we've done is we've established a uh, uh, advanced uh, learning page or, or series of lectures called the Essentials of Diving Medicine, which are primarily there to train uh, primary care physicians or um, physician assistants that are completely unfamiliar with medicine. Uh, and diving medicine specifically, I mean, um, but would be of great benefit to instructors. And Mona is uh, going to give you the links uh, so that you can get in and uh, you'll have access to those lectures, which um, include things like um, a fitness for recreational diving, a, a slightly expanded summary, all the tingles is not bends, um, there are certain nerves when they're compressed, they can resemble uh, tingling or weakness that uh, could, be an, could be an issue, but may result in a person unnecessarily being uh, taken to a recompression chamber when it was simply a nerve that was compressed. And then thirdly, <clears throat> the emergency management and uh, treatment for decompression illness. So those are just three of them. And uh, it's a resource that we'd really like you uh, to make use of. Uh, there's the um, Dan Southern Africa YouTube channel where we have topics like malaria and diving, which is very important. And we're going to mention that again and again. Uh, the links, as I mentioned, Mornay is going to uh, um, be sharing with you uh, after this. And there are, will be a replay of this uh, webinar for those who are interested. Uh, the fitness for recreational diving we've covered. Um, we've discussed the issues of age, pressure change, ears, um, that immersion adds 30% um, work on the heart. Um, the, uh, the fact that certification does not necessarily mean that you will stay that way for the rest of your life. And therefore, one needs to uh, be responsible about um, uh, the changes in one's health status and ultimately have a safety motivation that is focused on the people you're diving with rather than just your wish to dive. Uh, and I hope that, uh, we've, we've really hit that home. So check out dives, very valuable. Um, be trained. Um, and um, uh, if you have basic fitness, you are less likely to be harmed and you're able to assist others. So those are the things that we'd really like people to, uh, to consider. I mentioned the brisk five-minute walk as a minimum fitness level, and then individuals need to make their own decisions and need to make them wisely. There's a specialty lecture on decompression illness because it's a very advanced or very, very um, uh, complex topic, but we know that it only takes one and a half meters with a breath hold ascend to kill you with gas embolism. And if you were saturated at six meters, you could theoretically develop decompression uh, sickness. Now, it's unlikely that you'd stay that long, but it can happen. Um, nevertheless, the number of divers that develop decompression illness are fairly few, one to four per 10,000 dives, most of whom respond very well to treatment. So it's, it's, it's not as bad as it's sometimes made out to be. And there are other issues that are sometimes a far greater risk than decompression illness. And on top of that, about 50% of those who develop decompression illness um, it was not predicted by the tables or the dive computers for a variety of reasons, um, uh, because of repetitive dives, because of the, uh, the way uh, the person's physiology um, is at odds with the presumptions that the dive computer model was based on. Um, so we, we don't want to be judgmental about people developing decompression illness. Uh, we should just be aware that there is a risk 
and the risk is manageable, uh, but it, if you want to avoid the risk altogether, the only way to do so is to stay out, out of the water. Bubbles versus bends. Well, not all bubbles are bad. Uh, there are other sudden medical problems uh, that may present during diving that have nothing to do with bubbles. Um, and they may need uh, a medical attention like a heart attack or a stroke or something the like. Uh, so neurological issues um, that occur within six hours of diving are highly suspicious of a diving related problem, but co uh, conditions developing after 24 hours, and I would say even after 12 hours from diving are less and less likely to be diving related. So just bear that in mind because that's a very important um, understanding of the risks uh, related to diving. And uh, I mentioned that uh, some of the um, uh, uh, injuries may be mechanical. In other words, pressure on a nerve. Emergency management, there's a lecture on that. Uh, diving, we said there was a, there's a certain amount of exertion. Um, if you have a medical problem, you don't want to be far away from medical care. Uh, diving is part-time, which means that your skills may not be as sharp as you thought they were. So do your checkout dives. Um, some of uh, the risks uh, may already uh, uh, be assessed without even getting into the water. You can test people on a treadmill or with a brisk walk. They don't even need to get into the water before you already determine that there's a certain risk. And uh, health is often best if it is requested well in advance. And Dan uh, is really making very, very strong inroads in no notification, that people notify us about dive trips, about where they're going, so that if something happens in a remote location, it's not the first we've heard about it, there is already an understanding of how one would best approach the situation uh, if it were to occur uh, um, uh, in a relatively remote location. Malaria, there's a lot to be said about that. Um, uh, I, I can't cover that here. There's a whole lecture um, and many of the uh, guidelines for malaria uh, are equally applicable to dengue and, and other uh, diseases that are vector related. So uh, just consider those. And then their resources, uh, resources that sometimes people don't realize. Obviously, there's Dan. They're the centers for disease control that one can go to. And with armed with the information, we can try and eliminate the hazards or the risks. We can catch them early enough. And let, let me use malaria as an example. In other words, you can basically have barriers and you have, can have sprays and coils and nets and gauze and all the other things, long sleeves, not going outdoors after dusk. You can have your, your uh, coartum with you. And if there's a possibility that you have malaria, you take the medication early and tertiary. Well, you have a high index of suspicion and you uh, uh, make people aware and you yourself remain aware that up to a month after returning out of a malaria area, you may still develop malaria. So that's just something that you need to uh, remember. Please use us as a resource. And by the way, those of you that might be in remote locations, an excellent resource as to where you can get um, or where you can get lists of appropriate equipment to keep on hand uh, is uh, what cruise ships have come up with because they are as remote as it gets. And you'll find excellent lists if you just do very basic um, searches and there'll be links that will also take you there. And I'm almost at the end. Um, the lectures we mentioned, please look at ears and sinuses ear equalizing techniques, medication and diving. And the take home message is um, most safety measures are not sophisticated. They in fact, very, very simple. And uh, they are logical, they're common sense. 
but common sense isn't necessarily that common, uh, but we hope that it will become increasingly so as this culture of responsibility uh, continues to flourish as it does. It pays to obey um, and follow the rules. They're there for a reason. So at that point, I'll close off uh, the webinar as far as the presentation is concerned, but I'll be very happy to answer and entertain any questions that we have time for. Well, Dr. Cronier, fantastic. You know, <clears throat> all the, the information you shared, I can see quite a lot of excitement. People quite keen to get access to that uh, e-learning uh, uh, program you spoke of. So just to let you know, I will make that uh, link available tomorrow. Wonderful. Plus many, many others. So um, if you're ready, uh, I've got about 13 questions lined up. Um, so uh, I'll fire away and see how, how we go. Is that fine with you, Dr. Cronier? It's fine with me and the beauty of people being on Zoom, if they tire or they need to do other things then they, can, then, then they have an ability to leave without me being offended, which is what one of the greatest benefits of this platform. So uh, I'll be happy to be here as long as you'd like me to be. Fantastic. All right. Well, we got another question from Russell. Um, we have a strong culture of alcohol consumption in the evenings between diving days here in South Africa. Uh, other than dehydration, what are the risks associated with diving with a hangover, excluding residual alcohol and paying and paying uh, judgment? Thank you in advance. Yeah. Yeah, well, there, there haven't been uh, well-conducted prospective tests where they've inebriated people and uh, put them through <laughs> the process. Uh, um, I think that uh, there is certainly experience that individuals who are severely dehydrated, be that due to alcohol or be that due to a gastrointestinal illness, are more vulnerable to decompression illness. It is true that, and it is a reality, that uh, people are, um, uh, are, are prone to, uh, to enjoy um, alcohol in the evenings prior to diving. Um, and, and it would be naive to go into a sort of a, a prohibitionist sort of a stance. Um, but what I would want to add is that individuals who have had significant amounts of alcohol must realize that dehydration and more importantly, rehydration is a very important factor of them being ready to go diving the next day. And if they don't feel like diving, this culture of responsibility should really take its role. And yeah. that's perhaps one of the best places where it will have its role. Mm. Um, where uh, if you see that someone is really not up to it, um, they're nauseous, they are hungover, they haven't slept well, um, and uh, they're still under the influence of it that they shouldn't dive. So, you know, the obvious remains the obvious. And um, uh, I can't quote you figures because we don't have specific figures, but um, the odds definitely increase to have decompression illness uh, as a consequence. Um, uh, 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 and additional things like, like vertigo or, or motion sickness uh, as well, which is another complication of alcohol. Alcohol actually dissolves in the inner ear in selective ways, which is why some people, um, if they have a certain amount of alcohol on board, actually get nauseous. I find it in myself. If I'm, I'm, I'm actually auto automatically um, someone who can't have more than two beers, two glasses of wine, or two, two tots of whatever, because I found if I then lie down, there's actually a disparity between my inner ears, and I get nauseous. So I just don't do it. So for me, I've got a sort of a built-in checking system. Some of you may have the same. But the point of mentioning it is that your inner ear is affected by alcohol. And that is a sense that you rely on when you dive. Mm. And so you wouldn't want that to be impaired. So don't know whether I've answered the question, but it was an interesting one, nonetheless. Yes, and I think also the whole risk mitigation, DSO, HIRA aspect comes into play. One is a buddy, I guess. And two, the operator that's uh, offering you the service should uh, you know, uh, mitigate that risk and hopefully identify that. Uh, and so forth. But anyways, uh, another question from Russell. 
uh, in our small boats, uh, ribs or rubber ducks, uh, divers often become motion sick. Uh, the usual course of action is to encourage them to submerge as promptly as practical. Uh, is this appropriate given the risk of uh, uh, MSs? Uh, are there any other risks to consider with motion sickness? Uh, thank you in advance. Okay, well, that's a great question and um, the, the, the broad answers. Um, uh, I, I tend to grade people with motion sickness into four categories. Not grade naught are the individuals who never get motion sick and we all are envious of. Grade one are the people who are, get nauseous on boats but never underwater. Grade threes are individuals who will are, are prone to uh, get motion sickness underwater and may vomit underwater, which is a big thing. And grade four, are, uh, or, or grade three in this case, are individuals who have uh, ongoing motion sickness even after they've left the boat. Depending on each of these, I would have a different approach in uh, um, dealing or, or protecting them, if you like, from their motion sickness. And, um, and even the medication that one might use to mitigate uh, the, the decompression illness. One of the things that I would mention, which a uh, few people talk about, uh, but is very, very effective, is taking Phenagan, uh, if you want to write it down, Phenagan, P-H-N-A-G-A-N, um, 25 milligrams the night before. Because what happens is you actually sleep off the drowsiness. It's the equivalent of, of actually a blood alcohol level of 0 0.08. So it's almost the equivalent of being legally drunk in the old, as it was defined in the olden days. But the beauty is the next day, you still have the anti-emetic effect whilst the drowsiness has worn off. So that is a very, very useful typically very, very safe way to do it. There are other options. The ones that get really sick, we, we consider epinutin, which is an anti-epileptic drug, um, but it has certain provisos. And those that get nauseous only on the boat, Stugeron, uh, 25 milligrams, uh, usually is, is quite reasonable. And the principle that always applies is you first try it on land, never for the first time in water. Other than that, getting into the water quickly, if you can do that safely, appropriately, and without neglecting the safety of checking your equipment, because that's a big deal, um, I think the, the emphasis there would lie on the planning so that you can get into the water quickly and you make sure that you have done as much of your equipment checks and preparations in advance so that you can safely get into the water. Um, uh, you know, just bailing out and finding that you forgot your weight belt, uh, which has happened to me, uh, <laughs> you know, so those sort of things you don't want to have happen. Mm -hmm. So plan for it, deal with the motion sickness if it's relevant, and yes, get the people in the water if it's appropriate and the environment allows it and do it in a way that is safe. So great question, broad answer. And I hope I've touched on some of the things that, uh, yeah. that you uh, wanted me to address. Yeah, and there's actually a, a nice uh, article that uh, Dr. Van Yerden put together a couple of years ago, uh, plus other odd bits. I'll, I'll make a note, maybe add that in the, uh, you know, the follow-up email for tomorrow. Uh, I've got a question from Louis Engelbrecht, and he also posed the question just uh, before the uh, webinar, so maybe we can address that too. Uh, but he was just asking, you spoke about a, uh, a high court case ruling and so forth. Do you have any of the details and where can we, we find more information on that? So uh, I guess not so much fitness, but just a question. Although he sort of more diving fitness question had to do, um, if I remember correctly, with um, a contact lenses. Hmm. Yes. So, um, well, uh, let me address it the way I think it may have been posed. Hmm. First of all, diving with contact lenses has been around uh, for a very long time, and many people do. Uh, the disposable lenses are obviously the ones that are 
um, uh, you know, you're least concerned about losing um, the gas permeable, the old concerns we had about corneal squeeze have pretty much gone out the window with the modern contact lenses. So that's, uh, that's okay. The one thing I would warn people about is that if they do wear contact lenses, they shouldn't go cheap and, and use um, water instead of the contact uh, solution because there is uh, an acanthamoeba in infestation or infection that you can get and people can even go blind with it. So if you are going to use contact lenses, use them wisely. And uh, of course, if your mask floods, the first thing you do is close your eyes, if you can, depending on the environment, so that you keep the, the contact lenses, you don't lose them, clear your mask, and hopefully the lenses will still be in place. So that's pretty much as much as I can add on the contact lens issue. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for that. Another question from uh, Russell, this time to do with junior divers. Uh, he says, with respect to junior divers, or children, agencies usually limit them uh, to something like 12 to 18 meters of depth until a particular age, uh, for example, 15 or so forth. Is there a medical basis for this limitation or is it simply a matter of access to the surface? Thank you in advance. This is quite an interesting question, you know. Uh, mm. I mean, I have some thoughts on it. We've discussed this uh, in many other lectures, and we've also got a great article on that, which I think uh, Dr. Isabel de Pria uh, wrote a couple of years ago. Yes. So I'll also make a note and add that into that. But uh, I guess the broad strokes really is what are the main concerns with younger divers or, or, or um, you know, children under the age of 15? Yes. Well, I, I've addressed some of that previously, yeah. but um, uh, training agencies have essentially uh, got sort of this eight, eight year, 12 year, 14 year um, uh, range, if you like. So at eight years, there are programs where, where um, children are able to breathe on regulators, but they stay at the surface. Um, that's really a way to just get them used to the sport. And, and the idea is to ultimately keep them interested so that we get younger people getting into the sport. That's fine. And the risk is, 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 tri is, is trivial. Um, when it comes to um, the age, we use age as a marker really for a number of other things of which the two most important are one, that they are able to use the equipment in a way that is safe for them. And two, that they are able to make um, or, or that they are able to give appropriate informed consent because um, a person needs to know that they can die diving and uh, children don't necessarily have the insight. And so part of the reason why those ages were chosen were a combination of politics, economics, and pediatrics. So you had people who were representing children, who were representing the uh, training agencies, and who were representing the, uh, the, the various stakeholders in, in the training side. Um, and those ages were really set on that. Are they perfect? No, there have been fatalities, but there have been fatalities um, in, in, in various um, other contexts as well. Um, but those uh, approaches at least seem to be sensible. And they have, they have pretty much borne out the test of time as far as acceptable risk is concerned. Um, uh, maturity is really what you're looking for, apart from the physique and the understanding. And that is not always a function of age, but it is somewhat associated with age. And that is where some of those figures come from. Mm. Anything, uh, I know there were some folks in the past that uh, raised things of uh, growth issues, bone, uh, so forth and so forth. Um, is that still a concern or not really? 
I mentioned that previously, it's really an urban legend and almost irrelevant mm -hmm. because the type of exposure that it would take to get bubbles into that interface between the cartilage or the growth plate and bone leading to stunted growth um, is, is virtually impossible in the type of diving that children are, are, would participate in. Okay. The greater concern are the ones that I've mentioned. Perfect. All right. So, yeah, we got a question from Hein uh, Boucher. Um, have you had a look at the effects of muscle mass versus, I'm not familiar with this term, uh, all in capitals, S-A-C-R. Uh, any comments on this? S-A-C-R. Oh, sac rate. Sorry, there we go. Sac rate. Um, okay, surface air consumption. So, so we're looking at uh, anthropometric issues. And uh, the, the classic division is the ectomorph which uh, is sort of the, the lean, skinny sort of individual, the mesomorph, who's got a, a muscle bulk, and the endomorph, who typically uh, might be slightly more uh, obese um, and uh, sort of more um, apple-shaped, if you like. Um, the ectomorphs and the mesomorphs tend to float more, more, more easily. Um, the mesomorphs, the muscle and bone uh, mass predominant uh, individuals tend to sink more readily. And what we find is um, that the size of your lungs uh, usually <clears throat> determines your surface air consumption. Because the way in which you eliminate carbon dioxide is by, by flushing your lungs. So um, it is true that a certain amount of experience, training, being relaxed, um, not moving about too much, not exercising too much, reduces your surface air consumption. But I, but, but I have to say that it's really ultimately lung size, which determines the tidal volume, which determines how quickly you, you drain your cylinder. And um, mesomorphs tend to have fairly large lungs, Ectomorphs have long lungs, uh, and endomorphs um, uh, um, also have sort of smaller, smaller lungs. Um, but it ultimately uh, lies with lung size, mm -hmm. and that is one of the things we do with the diving medical. So we can predict a person's surface air consumption when we've done their lung function assessment. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, another question from Hein, which I think I can answer in part. Um, he's just asking about the COVID study that Dan uh, is doing. It's ongoing. Any feedback and findings, uh, you know, when, you know, sort of dates when we can expect certain info and so forth. And uh, maybe this is a question you can answer. I'll, I'll do the first part. And how might this impact fitness to dive in the future? So just uh, what I'll do um, about two months ago, Dr. Matthias Nacheta from the Dan America office. And also, oh, I'm just trying to remember uh, the other docs that were on the call. Anyways, they did a nice talk on at that stage where they were and the sort of beginnings of this survey uh, and study. And um, I'm sort of still in discussions with them. Obviously, it's still early for them to publish any uh, findings um, and I am planning to to sort of host a, a webinar uh, with some of the folks that are uh, involved with the study so uh, hopefully within a month or so I will um, have one of those going um, <clears throat> so I think it's still a bit early but what I'll do is share the link to the um, uh, what do you call it the webinar that um, uh, happened a month or two ago and, uh, you know, and the replay link. Then as far as uh, the impact on fitness uh, going forward, uh, you know, in the future, if you've suffered that, I don't know if there's sort of a generic answer you have at this stage, Dr. Cronier. Well, one of the uh, dilemmas we have at the moment is that um, the South African and I think uh, throughout the world, uh, many of the thoracic societies have actually... Um, gone against doing lung function testing because it's actually something that uh, could spread COVID. Mm. In fact, the, in, um, in aviation medicine, we are no longer 
uh, able to do lung functions. We have been forbidden, and we and if there is a lung concern, we refer them to a pulmonologist, and even they do not do the traditional lung function testing. Mm. So, I, uh, on the one hand, we're sort of driving blind. That's the one thing. On the other side, COVID isn't a single type of lung injury. You get a range of injuries that are related to COVID, and we are likely to find that certain types of injury are more significant than others. And the third is, uh, I think we're likely to find, as we did with asthma, that in the beginning, we thought that anybody who had asthma and went diving would die. Mm. And then eventually it came that it's actually not that much of a problem it's manageable and as long as you adhere to certain principles which are yet to be defined and is the purpose of the study we will probably be able to have a better idea whether the risk is greater or or lesser mm -hmm. but at the moment it's a big it's up for grabs it's a big question mark but I doubt that it is, it's going to have the impact that people fear it will have. Um, uh, but it's early days, and that's why we're asking the question, because that's what Dan does. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, we got Anonymous here. Uh, okay, so Hein says, appreciate that. Thanks for answering. And Hein, yeah, keep a lookout for the follow-up email tomorrow with all those additional links. Uh, Anonymous asks, uh, what about someone with renal dialysis? Uh, can these people dive? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there are different forms of re renal dialysis, um, and there are different risks as a relation in relation to renal di dialysis. Uh, depending on risk of infection, um, uh, uh, electrolyte stability, and, um, and also just access to uh, the renal dialysis, all of those things would play in. Are there people that are on renal dialysis that have gone diving? Yes, they have. Have they done so safely? Yes, they have. Does that mean it's safe for everybody? No it needs to be individualized. Mm -hmm. So it, I can't give a blanket yes, but it's also not a blanket no. Okay, great. So I uh, hope that answers the question. Um, I've got two questions from Adele Hutting, but the one kind of leads into the other. So I'll start with the first one and sort of jump into the uh, next set of uh, sort of questions and, and, and things she asks. Um, so it starts of what risks would be associated with diving uh, with hyper, uh, hypertension, okay? And then it continues, would uh, being fit mitigate the risk of diving with hypertension? And uh, what is the effect of hypertension medication? I heard that it may dehydrate you, so therefore should or shouldn't you uh, take the medication before diving? Thanks. Okay, so, well... Um, I'm sure you can answer, but we've done quite a lot of factoids on these. So I don't know if I should add those in as well, but I'll first allow you to answer it uh, via the webinar. And then, you know, I could add these kind of okay. factoids. Yes, because I, I think that a lot of things need to be answered accordingly. Um, uh, just quickly on the, on the issue of exercise, exercise is often an antidote to hypertension. So in other words, exercise may sometimes actually remove the, the problem with hypertension. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good thing in principle. Okay. Secondly, hypertension has different causes. Sometimes they are as a result of, for instance, kidney problems and other sort of problems, and sometimes they are unknown. Mm -hmm. Either way, there are a variety of medications that are, um, are used in the treatment um, of hypertension. And the ones that we tend to steer away from nowadays are the diuretics, which gets to what you were mentioning, um, be becoming dehydrated because there are such drugs. Uh, they are no longer the first line drug of choice. Um, and... Um, uh, the, the, uh, the second type are those that actually limit your ability to exercise, the beta blockers. Some of, some of them have become very refined and there are exceptions, but by and large, as a class, the beta blockers and diuretics we try and avoid. 
the the drugs that are sort of first choice when it comes to homegrown uh, run of the mill hypertension are the so-called angiotens uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, bearing in mind that uh, many, uh, uh, many, uh, at least a, a large percentage of individuals that take them tend to cough. And uh, the cough is a bit of a nuisance. And so there is a sort of a, a next level in the same track, which is called an angiotensin receptor blocker. And those seem to be um, the drugs that at least at this stage uh, seem to be the best as far as managing hypertension is concerned. Now, believe it or not, COVID actually <laughs> has uh, an influence on the angiotensin um, uh, pathway. And at the moment, we're not quite sure whether or not it's good to be on an angiotensin receptor blocker or not in the, in the COVID era. Mm. Um, uh, so far, the the recommendation is not to take people off angiotensin receptor blockers um, uh, just for the sake of, of, of COVID. Um, uh, that may change in the future. Uh, but, but I think that what one really is most concerned about with hypertension is either heart, heart attack, stroke, or uh, uh, exercise intolerance, which may go with it. And then, of course, the impact of the medication that you would be taking. Mm. So um, uh, I uh, defer to uh, Mornay's idea of the factoids, which I think are, are very good at, and, and uh, explore this uh, in far more detail. But it's an excellent question. Mm. Uh, the biggest question, though, is that one wants to make sure that you remain cardiovascularly fit mm. because uh, um, hypertension that is untreated predisposes you to heart attack and stroke. And that's the biggest issue. Mm. Then the treatment becomes the secondary issue and you want to choose a medication and there are a number to choose from, some of which um, are entirely safe with diving. All right. Well, I hope that answered the question. Next question is from Carl van der Kolf. Um, I'm just going to summarize what he says because uh, Carl uh, has painted a, a really nice picture here. But essentially, he had a fall and he hurt his ankle. And when he goes diving, it feels much better. And, uh, you know, when he does some deeper dives on night trucks, it really just feels awesome. And uh, he said today around the house, he's been doing some chores and now all of a sudden it's swollen again. So he wants to know, does the compression help or not when you go diving? Okay, that, well, that's a very interesting question. One, one of the problems with lower extremity injuries and foot and ankle injuries as such is gravity. Mm. Uh, because what, what happens then is blood tends to pool. And especially if there's been an injury, then the pooling may actually add to the injury and, and remain for a significant period of time mm. after the injury. Mm. And even more so if there's been deep venous thrombosis as a complication. So it's, it's um, intuitive that being in an environment which virtually is microgravity, which is what water is, mm. would uh, completely take away the gravity effect on the ankle and would therefore be a form of treatment, if you like, just because it works like a compression stocking would work. Um, uh, so as far as diving is concerned, I think that's fine. And there's also no proof that a prior injury predisposes you to decompression illness in a particular joint. There's no proof of that. Mm -hmm. So those are two things that, that I would say with that. Um, the third thing was that working around the house, um, the ankle started to swell again. There may be several reasons for that. Um, uh, overuse position, uh, being on your haunches, um, uh, the heat, all of those things may contribute to the swelling. Uh, what I would recommend is that maybe when you go to bed tonight, put your uh, swollen ankle on a pillow and raise it a little bit so that gravity can uh, get that ankle down again. Yeah. So I hope that that answers that question. 
Okay, well, uh, that, that was a great answer. So anonymous, yeah, uh, kind of an odd question, but um, we most probably could answer that between the two of us. Why don't we see more divers with injuries in South Africa? So I guess it also, well, I don't know exactly where it's coming from or how to, to find this, but most certainly the only kind of incidents we would be aware of, say from a Dan perspective, is if it was reported by the Dan hotline, either in the sense of us providing advice or assistance. Um, so I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Oh, and, and it could also speak that uh, people are safe divers, you know, taking into consideration, uh, you know, all the risks and uh, safety checks and so forth. Well, I'm glad to say the impression we're getting is that the number of diving fatalities have definitely um, bottomed out. Obviously, there have been years that they have been uh, more than other years. But by and large, our fatality rate based on the presumed number of active divers is really low. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, when it comes to injuries, of course, one needs to specify um, if, which I presume uh, um, is decompression illness uh, that you're referring to, um, it does indeed seem to be underrepresented in South Africa. Um, and um, I'm not quite sure whether that means that people just wait for it to go away because it's not serious enough or that uh, um, you know, it, it doesn't happen or that people are diving more conservatively um, all of those may be possible reasons, but uh, without the actual figures and project dive exploration or a dive safety laboratory are all designed to try and pick up on those numbers. Mm -hmm. So if you want a, a true number, then one needs to do a proper study. Mm -hmm. But uh, the indication certainly seems to be that uh, South Africa isn't overrepresented as far as either fatalities or injuries are concerned. I'm excluding a middle ear barotrauma, which remains a big ticket item and certainly still remains very, very common. Mm. Okay. So another question from Russell. He says, divers are admonished not to exert themselves after diving. Does this refer to... Uh, relatively sustained exertion or could even a very short period, example, walking up a slope out of the water with your dive gear on, precipitate an incident? Thank you in advance. Okay. Well, the uh, it's, it's really a, a question that hasn't got a final answer yet. But what we can say is that the greatest number of circulating bubbles are within the first two to four hours after a dive. So it would stand to reason that that is the period where you don't want to exert and thereby either force um, a patent for arm and a vale to open or a pulmonary shunt to actually allow bubbles through and cause problems. And so um, I would say that one should wait at least four hours before doing anything that would be considered relatively strenuous. Um, it's rather naive to, to think that one needs to wait 24 hours after diving um, uh, before exercising. So, uh, uh, and, and this is an opinion, it's not uh, based on double blind randomized studies, but I would say that one should wait at least six to eight hours before uh, undertaking a significant exercise after diving and certainly never within the first two hours. Okay. All right. So we've got uh, <clears throat> a question from uh, Andre. Um, he wants to know, he gets a neck ache every now and again from diving. And he wants to know, can I take a discipline before diving or will it do any harm? Okay. Well, the first question obviously is why is there a neck ache? Mm. Uh, is it related to the position of the, of the uh, tank? Uh, does it have to do with, with, with anything um, that can be modified uh, just equipment wise? Mm. Because rather than treating the ache, one would want to avoid it. So 
uh, working on the assumption that you've tried everything in terms of putting the cylinder a little bit, you know, the pull of valve a little bit lower that you don't have to sort of hyper extend the neck, et cetera, et cetera. Um, taking, um, uh, taking a disprin uh, is something that it has even been recommended in certain parts of the world. We're not particularly fond of that because of the concerns related to potential aggravation of spinal cord or inner ear bleeds. Um, but that would mean that you would be doing dives where those uh, probabilities are high. Mm. And those probabilities are really only somewhat elevated when you're diving deeper than 24 meters. So if you're diving 18 to 24 meter dives, a single discipline is really not going to make much of a difference. A discipline is possibly not the best choice because of its effect on the stomach. But um, uh, the, the principle behind the matter is that you would probably not be putting yourself at a risk of aggravating the consequences of decompression illness. And I would encourage you to, to see if you can find a postural way mm. of avoiding the neck ache rather than uh, um, um, to medicate it. All right. So um, I see we're hitting the hour and a half mark. There's another five odd questions or so. Um, are you happy to continue with them or shall I uh, add them in a mail and we can actually, uh, you know, send people, a, 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 you know, answer their questions by email? Which do you prefer? I'm very happy to answer them. Uh, okay. If people, uh, people have had enough, uh, they, they, you know, they, are welcome to disinvite themselves. I won't take offense. Okay. Um, so, uh, but I'd like to honor those that have stayed on and want to ask the question. So I'm happy to do that. All right. Well, let's uh, keep going. Uh, another question from Andre. Uh, is it bad to push your lungs to inflate and deflate to use your lung capacity to control your diving depth? So I guess you submerge, you're busy diving, deep breath, you surface a little bit, uh, blow out, you descent again yes well um, in other words uh, essentially using your lungs as a means of um, uh, almost like a buoyancy compensator so that you can move yourself up and down mm -hmm. um, uh, the the dilemma with that is that there is potential for lung overpressure injury but in truth if you are diving relatively deep the chances of that are very low um, as, as a matter of principle uh, and just uh, not holding your breath being one of the tenets of diving um, I would not encourage um, individuals to hold their breath at any stage, mm. but taking a deeper breath in order to have a slight increase. Um, it's impossible to burst your lungs while breathing in. If I can put it that way. Mm. So if you are breathing in, then, then there is no risk of a lung overpressure injury because then you would start breathing out. <laughs> you know, the pressure would immediately start uh, an exhalation process. Mm. So, so if, if you continuously breathe, then that is not a big issue. Mm. If you deliberately hold your breath mm. or try and sort of keep, the, uh, keep your breath static, which is holding your breath, that I would not encourage. Mm. But simply using changes in tidal volume um, to... Uh, um, to steer yourself under underwater, I think is pretty much something almost all of us do to, to a greater or a lesser extent. What you want to avoid is to, to breathe at the upper levels of your lungs. In other words, have your lungs full and essentially just breathe in the top bit of your, your lung volume. Mm. What you want is you want to have a nice relaxed mid-level breathing so you don't want to and then you know they're full and then keep it <gasps> right at their foot you know at their fullest what you want is you want to be sort of in the middle that you have range 
both for inspiratory and expiratory capacity. So that is what I would recommend and that you would set your buoyancy compensator so that you can then stay mid-range. Mm. So don't go top range of breathing, stay in the mid-range and never hold your breath. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. So a question from Milani on the point of eyes. Um, how long after having something like LASIK would it be considered safe to dive? Okay, that has changed somewhat and it's become quite, uh, uh, quite lenient. Mm. Um, there are some ophthalmologists that would even allow a person to return to diving after six weeks. Um, uh, others are very conservative and say six months. Mm. Um, one of the magical uh, sort of periods that we have in medicine is six weeks or three months. And it's based on the fact that most, uh, the greatest amount of healing of any type of injury tends to occur within the first six weeks to three months. Mm. So if you don't know the answer, then it's usually three, uh, six weeks to three months. But um, uh, I, would, I would recommend that the individual ask their ophthalmologist. And then there's also Frank Butler's article. You can look him up. He is a Navy diver and he's an ophthalmologist. And he, he has written excellent articles about this. And, uh, and, and we recommend at this stage, at least, um, um, his, his guidelines. And so far with the LASIK so far, it has been um, um, a, a for, waiting for a period of uh, six months. Mm. Okay. So another question from Russell, I think you might have answered this during the, uh, the presentation, but anyways, here it goes, it says, are any of the common anti-malaria medications contraindicating uh, for diving? Absolutely. Hmm. Um, <laughs> the, the, the one drug that we really don't want divers or pilots to take is mefloquine or larium. Hmm. Um, because it can have psychiatric side effects and sometimes has be, had symptoms or presented with symptoms that were uh, confused with decompression illness and people got recompression for larium. Having said that, its convenience is that it can be taken by younger individuals. It's a once a week dose. Um, the disadvantage is that a single dose of larium can give you four weeks of side effects, meaning that you can't die for four weeks. And it's only after four weeks of taking it every week that you know whether or not um, you are likely to get side effects from larium. So having said that, where I'm heading with this is, if you have someone who asks you for malaria prophylaxis, you won't recommend larium. You'll recommend either a chloric, um, sorry, a doxycycline or malarone and malanol. And there are reasons for both. Dox doxycycline is very inexpensive. Malarone, malanol is more expensive, but it work, it, it's pretty much if you don't know the individual, that's, that's the medication that you can prescribe for almost everybody. Um, there is a slight increase in motion sickness, but, it, but it's not significant. Doxycycline has other side effects, senses, sensitizes you to sunlight. Um, but other than that, it's usually very well tolerated. What I would say, if someone has already been on mephilium or larium for four weeks and has no side effects, then I would not necessarily insist that they stop diving. Mm. And I would, in that case, make an individualized decision and say that that individual can probably continue diving with the larium. Mm. But I would never prescribe that as a primary chemoprophylactic for malaria. Okay, well, I think that answers the question loud and clear. Uh, Carlo has got a question. He says, hi, great talk. Um, he goes on to say, um, I don't often suffer from nausea anymore. What very often happens to me is that uh, the instant I surface after a dive, head above water, I get the strong urge to vomit. I burp a lot. Uh, I don't actually vomit. 
Um, it lasts for a minute or two, and then I feel great again. Uh, do you perhaps have any explanation for this? Yes, it's a combination of alternobaric vertigo and gastric distension, both of which um, provoke nausea. Overextension of the stomach causes it. And also what you're describing classically is as you break the surface, surface there's a difference um, uh, between the pressure in the one ear versus the other, which is quite common. Mm. Uh, in fact, I'd, I'd like to ask him via you, Mornay, or him yeah. listening in, um, to just uh, pay attention to when he equalizes his ears, is there a significant difference between the rate at which the ears equalize? Okay. Well, we'll ask him to maybe just, uh, uh, you know, Carlo, if he can in the chat box or Q&A, just let us know um, if, uh, if you experienced that. While he's doing that, I remember either yourself or Dr. Celia Roberts wrote a, a fantastic article on this as well. So I need to keep up with all the notes to add that in. But uh, anyways, it might be nice to add that article as a link as well. Because what you, what you would find is the ear that tends to maintain pressure longer than the other. Mm. If, <laughs> and I know this sounds like a Buddha rat, if I can call it that. But if you literally keep your thumb uh, uh, on the external ear canal of that ear, the one that tends to hold pressure back, then you won't have that symptom on the surface. Mm. So he did get back. He says, yes, there's a difference in the rate of equalizing. So I think you've answered his question. And okay. I'll try to remember to add that link in as well to the article. All right. All right. Let's see. Who else have we got here? Andre again. Uh, if you have ringing ear syndrome uh, day to day, and um, when you dive, your ringing ears stop. Why is this? Ah, um, well, there are a variety of reasons for that. Um, tinnitus is, a, a, well, let me give you a, a framework for it. Tinnitus or ringing in the ears is often, not always, but often, um, the result of uh, a lack of signal to the brain as a result of damage of the outer um, hair cells of the ear. So what happens is, and um, maybe you'll remember it from the electronic sort of paradigm, you used to have a pre-amplifier and then an amplifier. Now, the outer hair cells work like a pre-amplifier. They take the signal from the microphone, they, they, they increase it a little bit, and from there, it goes into the proper amplifier. Now, what happens is when you lose outer hair cells, you lose the amplifier, or, or sorry, the pre-amplifier's function of the outer hair cells, and then the brain actually tries to, to compensate by increasing gain, if you'd like to call it, to keep it within the electronic um, uh, parlance, and you get tinnitus uh, as a result. It's like hiss, like the old tape decks. Mm. So, so that's one of the reasons why that happens. Why one is less uh, aware of it is because if one is in an environment where there's a lot of noise or a lot of sound, the brain actually has to deal with a lot of input, Mm. And therefore, there isn't that much emphasis on the frequencies or the areas where the tinnitus occurs. And people are usually most aware of tinnitus when, they're, when there's silence, mm. uh, when uh, either they put in earplugs or uh, if they're in a silent room or they're going to bed. So um, there's a whole uh, lecture that I can give on tinnitus. And uh, if um, Mona, if you would add that to yet another note. Um, yeah. I'll be happy to, um, uh, to send more detailed answers. But if you could give me an indication whether this has addressed um, the individual's question at all. Okay. Now, uh, so I'll wait for, um, uh, you know, the answer. Either, okay. Uh, uh, Carlo, okay. Um, while we wait, Lily Kutsia has got quite an interesting question. She says, what age would be recommended for juniors diagnosed with hemophilia to start diving specifically 
from a physio uh, physiology uh, perspective? Well, there are different types of hemophilia. And uh, so it's one of those famous, de it depends type of answers. But in general, hemophilia is, is not a condition that you would want someone to be diving with for the simple reason that they are very prone to bleeding. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, if they have significant bleeding, either in the ear, spinal cord, um, um, uh, uh, or the brain for that matter, uh, it could could compound a minor injury into a major one. Mm. And then there are more than enough opportunities for trauma um, uh, while diving, both on the boat and underwater. So hemophilia is usually a contraindication to diving. Okay. So uh, Osman, uh, oh, sorry, uh, let me just see. Amazon Naidu, he's... Um, basically uh, visits uh, Tanzania quite often, then takes uh, malaria prophylaxis. I'm going to try to get the, uh, the name correct. Uh, it looks like Otto Vanku, uh, I don't know, A-T-O-V-A-Q-U-O-N-E, 200 milligrams every day, 250 milligrams every day. Uh, I, you know, he says, I will have stopped taking this by the time I dive. Any comments? I've been on it for three months, no side effects. Medication name, uh, Malatek, it seems like. Um, okay, it, it, it might be a generic version of uh, Mefloquine. Um, okay. You must just have a look at what the uh, um, the active ingredient is. If it is mefloquin, then my earlier comment um, holds for him, meaning that after having taken it for four weeks and not having psychiatric or other side effects, uh, mm. larium seems to be okay for him to dive. But that would be an individual um, recommend, recommendation or or possibility that would apply only to him, but should not be generalized. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, it adds a couple of few other pointers in, but I think that addresses the question. Um, uh, if you have more, you know, just uh, send uh, me a reply to the mail that I'll send out tomorrow, and I can pass that on to, to Dr. Cronier. Um, all right, so let me just see where we're at here. Almost done. Two more questions to go. Oh, no, Andre, uh, about the other question. I must now remember what it was. He says, yes, thanks. You addressed his uh, oh, okay. question. Yeah. All right. Okay, so, Russell, last question. Um, is Dr. Cronier familiar with the ODI vascular microbubble sensor system? And will Dan have access to their database for research purposes? Uh, could dive computers be programmed per individual diver based on post-dive bubble studies? Many thanks. So when I when I read this question, I think of uh, Dr. Alessandro Moroni. You know, they've done quite a lot on this side, but I don't know if it's exactly to do with this uh, particular question. And just before I hand over to you, Dr. Cronier, I actually invited him. He'll be one of our guest speakers in November. And he's going to be talking about the recent deep uh, deep stop studies that him, Simon Mitchell, and so forth have revisited again. So just keep a lookout for that. And I'll hand over to you now uh, to possibly answer this question. Yes, the uh, great question. Uh, the dilemma with bubbles after diving is that um, we still don't have a very good correlation between bubble volume. Uh, and the, even the number of bubbles and the onset of clinical decompression illness. So one, one can eventually develop a very, very uh, high resolution mechanism of looking at bubbles, but that may not necessarily be helpful in predicting decompression illness at all. In other words, it's sort of um, using uh, 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 measuring millimeters for something that you would be able to determine in meters. So I think that uh, it, it might be too fine an instrument uh, to be of value um, in predicting decompression illness, 
But on the other hand, it might be something that could be useful in a research setting, uh, bearing in mind that the same individual from day to day, dive to dive, has variability. So um, it makes it very, very difficult uh, to work on micro bubbles as an actual phenomenon rather than a theoretical one. All right. Well, I hope that answers the question. Um, that brings us to, to the end of all. The, I mean, these were great questions. I mean, it's such a range. And uh, I mean, we've got uh, pretty much 80%, if not more, of the folks that have stuck around. So thank you for that. Um, maybe before we continue, I think it's lucky draw time, you know, and then uh, we can uh, head towards the end. So if you allow me just to... Uh, uh, get all the names and enter them so i will quickly do that i'll i'll stop screen sharing okay um i won't share my screen just for privacy point of view so i'll just enter them in and then uh, draw the the names so uh, just give me a second yeah everybody i hope the uh, anticipation is building um okay all right, let me hit the button and see where it goes. All right, I've got three names. I don't know if they're still on uh, uh, the webinar. I haven't uh, looked, but uh, Milani Park Ross is the first winner of the, the, the Dan Buff. Second one, uh, Peter van, uh, de, van der Baal, and then Naomi van der Kolf. Uh, those are the three winners of the Dan Buffs this evening. I'll be in touch with them um, tomorrow or during the course of the week just to get all their details so we can get those prizes to them. So I hope you'll wear them with pride and that you enjoy them. Uh, but uh, yeah, for the rest, what a fantastic presentation yet again, uh, Dr. Cronier. It's always great to have you on board and, you know, based on some of the the feedback that I've seen in the chat line, everybody seems, uh, you know, happy, thankful, uh, you know, great comments all around. So once again, great job. Uh, thanks for, for, for being uh, the guest speaker and, you know, discussing this uh, uh, interesting topic. Now, there's obviously so much more. And, uh, you know, again, you've made it so much e so easy for everybody to learn more. And through this program uh, that, will, uh, that I'll share the link to the um, essentials of dive medicine, folks can dig into that and uh, learn more at their own pace, you know. So once they register, they can get in. Best part, it's free, you know. So that's, uh, I think, one of the nice things about Dan. We like to share things. Uh, for the folks that are still around, thank you so much for sticking around till the end. For the folks that have left, I understand uh, if you want to watch the replay to catch up on some of the questions or the Q&A uh, session, that's great. But really, thank you for, uh, for everybody that's um, participating in these Dan webinars and the support. And for the folks that, uh, you know, want to learn more about Dan or aren't Dan members and would like to join, best place to do that is via the website. It's www.dansa.org. And, um, you know, for those folks that are already Dan members, make sure that you've renewed your membership, seeing that people are getting back into the water. And for those that are active, thank you so much for your support. Without uh, your fees, we can't keep services like the hotline running, the research we do, these kind of webinars. So we really appreciate it. And uh, please tell your dive buddies about us and what we're doing so we can help grow this organization and share all the knowledge that we have. And if you have anything uh, to share, please let us know. Uh, and who knows, maybe I can host you as one of the webinar guests. Um, so Dr. Cronier, with that said, any parting words uh, or messages from your side? Well, my greatest appreciation for those of you that uh, tuned in for your passion, uh, not only for diving, but also for learning about diving and the people that you'll be in interacting with and um, for, for giving me an opportunity to talk about something I really love yeah. uh, uh, and an organization for which uh, I'll always have a, a lingering passion. Thank you very much, Mornay. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if you're willing, we'll keep hosting you. Uh, there's lots more topics that we can explore. Uh, just for the folks to remind me again, the, the replay will be available via the follow-up email. And if you don't get it by any chance, look on the Facebook page. The replay will be there or even via the Dan YouTube channel. I'll post it there. 
And, uh, you know, if you don't get the email by, you know, uh, some chance, I'll also add all the links into the um, uh, notes sections of both platforms, Facebook and YouTube. So you'll be able to access, you know, the alert divers, the diving reports, the essentials of diving and the articles we spoke of and so much more. Once again, thank you for your participation. Dr. Cronier, as always, thank you for, for sharing your knowledge with us. With that said, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Good night until the next webinar. Good night. Good night.